Before we get into the nitty-gritty details of glycolysis, I wanted to return to this general point that metabolism is really governed by the fundamental principles and concepts of chemistry, such as the laws of thermodynamics, the feasibility of reaction mechanisms, things like intermediate stability and activation energy considerations, and the physical chemical properties of intermediates. Are they, for example, reactive with the major biomolecules, or do they engage in strong intermolecular forces with each other or with other biomolecules? So I wanted to take a moment in this video to survey some of the general concepts in play when we think about the principles of metabolism and really try to answer this question of why metabolic pathways are structured the way they are at a level that's deeper than just evolution wants it that way. There are certain chemical determinants of metabolism that are worth keeping in mind as well. The first, and arguably the most important, is thermodynamics and the laws of thermodynamics. More specifically, considerations like enthalpy change, entropy change, and free energy change are vital to the understanding of metabolic pathways. This is because Metabolic pathways and metabolic reactions cannot violate the laws of thermodynamics. The entire system of reactions upon which metabolism is built, for example, must be associated with a negative free energy so that it can proceed spontaneously. And the laws of thermodynamics do exert a strong effect on the structures of metabolic pathways. Just to give an example of this, we can think about reductions performed by the reducing agent NADH or NADPH. The oxidation of NAD H to NAD plus is associated with some energy change, and here it's measured in the voltage or the potential associated with this half reaction. That potential is only capable of reducing certain classes of functional groups. So for example, we're familiar with the idea that NADH can reduce a carbonyl compound to a hydroxycarbon or an alcohol. And here the electrons are flowing from NADPH right here through the carbonyl compound ultimately to the hydroxycarbon or alcohol product. This is a favorable process, but there's a limit to the types of compounds that can be reduced by NADH. Specifically, once our reduction potential gets too negative, once we get, for example, down to this carboxylic acid reduction to an aldehyde, we're too negative. NADH can't accomplish this reduction on its own, as this would violate the laws of thermodynamics. In essence, on this graph, which is a measure of the energy change or the potential associated with a reduction half reaction from the left to the right-hand side, we can only move up this ladder and never down. And that places important restrictions, for example, on what NADH is capable of or the types of compounds that can be phosphorylated through ATP hydrolysis, or the types of compounds that can phosphorylate ATP in the reverse direction. A second important point to consider is that metabolism is limited by the feasibility of reaction mechanisms. And really what this means in practice is that metabolic reactions, because they have to be catalyzed by enzymes, must rely on general acid-base catalysis, and this does place a limitation on the types of elementary steps that can occur. Although we haven't seen it much in this course, base metal redox chemistry, for example, the redox chemistry of iron, can also be taken advantage of for enzymatic oxidation or reduction reactions, for example. But primarily, general acid-base catalysis is where we'll focus our attention. And just to give an example of this, I pulled this figure, by the way, from a great paper which discusses a lot of these issues that I would strongly encourage you to check out about the principles of metabolism and how they apply to glycolysis. And this particular figure focuses on the fate of glyceraldehyde, which is this three-carbon fragment that emerges from the first stage of glycolysis. In essence, what happens to glyceraldehyde in the ensuing metabolic steps is what the paper calls an electron rearrangement. The movement of electrons within the molecule to create a different skeleton that's overall redox neutral. So while pyruvate is oxidized with respect to glyceraldehyde, a reduced form, lactate, is not. And 3-hydroxypropionate, which is just an isomer of lactate, is also redox neutral with glyceraldehyde. And you can see that if you count the number of CO bonds in these compounds. There are a number of different ways we can envision glyceraldehyde being converted into these isomers with the generation of energy through, for example, two ATPs via this rearrangement, two ATPs via this rearrangement, or one each through a two-step process here and here on the other side. These electron rearrangements release energy, 
but not all of them are equally feasible. And the reason is that the mechanisms involved are different and potentially impossible based on how enzyme catalysis generally has to work. So just as an example, the conversion of glyceraldehyde to lactate, the direct conversion of glyceraldehyde to lactate, involves the reduction of a hydroxyl group, the hydrogens are left out, but this is a hydroxyl group here, to a hydrocarbon group here. At the same time, the carbonyl, the aldehyde here, is oxidized to a carboxylate or a carboxylic acid. This can't happen in a single elementary step. There's no way, even in the context of enzyme catalysis, to replace a hydroxyl group with H directly. Instead, what we have to do is eliminate water from these two carbons, which creates a carbon-carbon double bond, and then reduce that double bond using something like NADH. A similar idea applies to this rearrangement. Here, we need to reduce this central alcohol or hydroxy carbon group into a hydrocarbon group. And again, we can't do it just through replacement of OH for H. We have to first eliminate water and then reduce the resulting CC double bond using something like NADH, a reducing agent. Finally, we need to keep in mind that the physical chemical properties of metabolites or intermediates in metabolic pathways play a role in the structure of metabolism. Properties like the stability of intermediates, their toxicity, how they affect other biomolecules, their permeability through the cell membrane, can the cell hold on to them, and their affinity for enzymes and other biomolecules all play a role in the structures of metabolic pathways. And this slide shows some examples of this. Here are three possible mechanistic pathways that glyceraldehyde could follow in a metabolic system. In the first, water is eliminated, an H from carbon 2 and an OH at carbon 3, to form an enol intermediate. Now the enol is unstable, and so it's going to quickly give rise to this compound, which is methyl glyoxyl. From the laboratory chemist's perspective, this looks fairly innocuous, but methyl glyoxyl, in fact, is actually quite a toxic compound thanks to its two adjacent carbonyl groups right here. It's a very strong electrophile as a result of those two adjacent carbonyl groups. And really, if you look at this molecule long enough, the thing you'll realize is that this wants to be lactate. The addition of water to methyl glyoxyl to form lactate is heavily favored, and that makes this compound fairly toxic in the body. It can scavenge water, it can condense with free amino acids to form amines and do all kinds of other things that a biochemical system does not want it to do. A second possibility is the elimination of water in the opposite direction, forming again an enol but a different dicarbonyl compound after isomerization of the enol to the keto form, tautomerization. In this product, malandialdehyde, we again have two carbonyl groups. But the issue here is that we have a carbon between the carbonyl groups that is highly acidic. And again, from a laboratory chemist's perspective, we may not appreciate that these hydrogens between the two aldehyde groups are quite acidic. But in a biochemical environment, when that acidity starts approaching a pKa of near 7, that starts getting serious because this carbon has the potential then to act as a nucleophile. It can do things like Michael addition to unsaturated carbonyl compounds, for example. So like methyl glyoxyl, malandialdehyde is similarly quite toxic because it engages in a number of problematic side reactions with biomolecules. It's also important to consider the stability of proposed intermediates in metabolic mechanisms. A third possibility for elimination of water from glyceraldehyde involves elimination of the aldehyde hydrogen and the OH group connected to carbon 2 to form an intermediate with a CC and CO bond sharing a common carbon. This is called a ketene, and ketenes are highly, highly unstable. While this is potentially a valid mechanism to get us to 3-hydroxypropionate, this intermediate here, it's a valid way to affect this electronic rearrangement, the problem is that getting to the ketene intermediate is prohibitively high in energy. It's so high in energy that not even catalysis by an enzyme can facilitate the formation of this type of intermediate. It's also highly reactive with all manner of nucleophiles. A ketene found in an enzyme's active site, for example, would be readily added to by enzymatic residues that are in any way, shape, or form nucleophilic, like serine hydroxyls or the lysine nitrogen. A variety of nucleophiles would intercept this thing, likely at a rate comparable to water if it shows up inside an enzyme's active site. 
Finally, it's important to consider the physical properties of metabolites as well. Permeability and the affinity of a metabolite for other biomolecules are also important to think about. Permeability and affinity matter, and the case in point is that the first step of glycolysis at the very beginning of stage one involves the installation of the phosphoryl group on carbon-6. And actually through the remainder of the entire glycolytic pathway, there's always a phosphate group hanging around on all of the metabolic intermediates. This includes at the split, we end up with two compounds, both of which contain phosphorus, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, remember this was DHAP, as well as glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or G3P. Both of these contain phosphate groups. And even further down the line, we retain a phosphate group in the entire three carbon pathway, the entirety of stage two. The reason for this has to do with permeability. The cell wants to retain glucose so that it can efficiently carry it through the glycolysis pathway. But in order to do that, it needs to install a charge, specifically a negative charge, on the glucose backbone. And it does that through phosphorylation. And it maintains that negative charge throughout the glycolysis pathway to avoid the loss of any small molecule intermediates through the cell membrane. This also facilitates binding of those intermediates to various enzymes. And so here we see the importance of affinity or the binding propensity of these intermediates to enzyme active sites. The negative charge in the molecules makes them much easier to bind in enzymes using positively charged residues like lysines and arginines. The general picture here is that the fundamental chemical properties, the reactivity, and the physical properties of metabolites dictate the structure of metabolism. Metabolism has to occur in a controlled manner, meaning we have to use intermediates that are relatively low toxicity, relatively stable. We can't have very high energy positive or negative charges or unstable functional groups like enols and ketenes. And ideally, metabolites have essentially zero permeability through the cell wall and a strong affinity for enzyme active sites so that they're efficiently bound and reacted through metabolic pathways.